The universal basic income has been proposed in various countries, quite a radical change to society, partially in relation to predicted future changes in society, in relation to automation, partly as a method of dealing with poverty and income disparity. Now the income is supposed to be enough to meet just the basic needs of a person in that particular society. The precise level of income will vary depending upon the society where it's being introduced. Now, any introduction of a universal basic income faces huge economic, political and social challenges. The disruptive effect of introducing these changes makes them look unfeasible. However, their proponents argue that sitting back and doing nothing result in society facing even bigger challenges than those created by introducing a universal basic income. In order to look at whether the pros and cons of introducing such a system are possible, we have to look at first back in history to see how we arrived at our current situation. Whilst different countries have radically different current systems of dealing with the poorest members of society, most of the world is heavily influenced by what occurred during the Victorian era in the United Kingdom. The UK, one of the first economies in the world to industrialise, created a radical shift in the population, people moving from the countryside to the towns and cities. This urbanisation has been repeated around the world. The shift in population was extremely rapid, and vast slum areas developed in existing cities, and some villages became large cities in just a few years. Conditions in the poorer areas were concerned for the government, and for others as well. Part of this was due to the welfare of the people living in those conditions, partly to the wave of revolutions across the European continent. The government was afraid what a large mass of discontented people might actually end up doing. There were two very different conclusions that were arrived at to the cause and solution of this new urban poverty. One view, there were several types of poor people. Two of the major types being described as the deserving and the undeserving poor. Now the deserving poor included the elderly, the sick and injured, those widows trying to raise families alone. The undeserving poor included drunkards, lazy, wastrels and malingerers. They proposed that any government or societal action be targeted at the deserving poor and the undeserving poor be made to work before any assistance should be actually given to them. The thought behind this was that Unless the restriction was applied, the undeserving poor would just be freeloading the back of society. The other view was that the poor were victims of circumstance. The initial lack of education, money and assets meant they were dependent upon others for jobs and wages and had no opportunity to better themselves or remove themselves from the poverty trap, no matter how hard they worked or tried. Any small period of bad luck, like injury, Sickness was enough to turn these people from poor to destitute. The thought was that a small change of their circumstances for those at the bottom of society could have a dramatic change not just at those on the, that bottom rung, but also for a society as a whole. These two attitudes to the poor generally had two different approaches to the issue of poverty. One of these was the widespread introduction of workhouses, where very basic accommodation and food were provided for those who needed it. These were such at a basic level that anyone who could do would work, work to do anything to avoid the workhouse. As a result, it was mostly the elderly or children who made up the majority of those actually using the facilities. Workhouses were not meant to be a method of preventing poverty, instead were a safety net for preventing starved masses rebelling across the, the country. By providing a bare minimal for survival, thereby encouraging those who could work to take up what jobs were offered no matter what the conditions were. This would mean that those who lacked the motivation and drive to improve themselves could be given a hand up, but not a hand out. The alternative reaction to extreme poverty was taken up by some large-scale employers, who for the most part were Quakers like Cadbury and Derby. Quakers were barred from entering most of the traditional areas of society, so the Quakers took their ethical stance into business in a big way. As such, they were major employers in manufacturing of things like chocolate, iron, steel, locomotives, as well as being in banking. But one of the fundamental beliefs of the Quakers was that of respect for others, led them to carry out what may, may be regarded as ethical business practices today. They believe in fairness, peace, cooperation, innovation and education. 
These practices at the time enabled them to be a major part of their various sectors. They carried this forward into the dealings with their employees, built quality housing for them to live in, paid relatively good wages, set up schools for the children, consulted the workforce on how improvements could be made, and even tried to treat men and women equally. The result of these steps were that the Quakers had a productive, well-trained, healthy, loyal workforce. It showed that large portions of the poor, when given the opportunity, wouldn't actually live in squalor. If circumstances were right, they could actually improve their situation. It was a time thought that the Quakers were only employing a relatively small percentage of the workforce. They might just be employing the more flexible and quality end of the poor workforce were attracted by the better conditions created by the Quakers. Now some of you may be wondering what this history trip has to do with universal basic income. Well, some of the attitudes of the poor members of society that exist in Victorian society still exist today, and that attitude can alter opinions as to the viability of a universal basic income. One end of the spectrum, you have those who regard any payment of money to everyone encourage people to be lazy and not to work so they'll be paid money whether they work or not. At the other end you have people who give money they can invest it in education, health, housing, innovate, take risks, or know that they have a basic income to rely on if anything goes wrong. The real key here of course is that both views are both right and both wrong at the same time. There won't be a blanket reaction to a universal basic income and get both extremes happening, as well as many shades in between those extremes. What you have to decide is whether the impact as a whole is beneficial, not whether some individuals are abusing the system, or even if some individuals are making great success of the system. In addition, you have to look at how the changes brought about by a universal basic income may actually alter society in general, how it functions, whether those changes are worth the effort that's involved. So most people's view of a universal basic income were coloured by their political background and the societal view on topics such as social inequality and income redistribution. This in turn will result in difference in how they measure success or failures of a policy of a universal basic income. In an attempt to avoid those conflicts, I'll focus primarily on the potential impacts on a broad range of economic basics and those involving social change. And whilst there have been some attempts at a universal basic income in different countries around the world, they've usually had either restrictions on who has been entitled to them, or restriction to a region of a particular country. But where they've been tried or trialled, the impact has been largely positive, and there's so far been no disastrous impact on the economy as a result of their introduction. Now, two fundamental things to consider at the outset of a universal basic income. Those are the level of development of the country involved and the economic strength of the country. Now, due to the challenges and disruptions that the introductions of such a policy may bring, it only to be sensible to introduce a system in a country with a growing economy and a low level of national debt. Development of the country will alter the level of income which is distributed and the uses that people receiving it will actually put it to. For instance, developing countries Basic income has been used primarily to pay for what might be considered as basics such as food, clothing and education. Now, most of the interest though in recent times has been what has happened the universal basic income will introduce in a major developed economy. Now, the first likely impact of course to increase the overall level of taxation in order to pay for the distribution of the income. It is likely to produce a net decrease the money for the wealthiest members of society. The middle part of society would have increased taxes, these would be balanced out by the additional payments. The poorest members of society would have an increase in their money. However, this increase in taxation and corresponding spending power of the population may also create, in turn, additional inflationary pressures on the economy. Whilst these pressures are likely to be initially significant, the impact should reduce over time. The general proposed level of universal basic income would mean that it's highly unlikely that many people would be content to do nothing, as the level of payments would be to a very low standard of living. However, people may be more inclined to do part-time jobs rather than full-time work, and also change the jobs to ones that they consider more rewarding or less stressful. 
This of course has led worries about how employers are going to find enough workers to do some of the less rewarding jobs in society. Part of this solution is one of the main reasons for introducing a basic income in the first place, which is automation and technology, to make many of the existing jobs redundant. So the overall number of hours available for people to work will actually have been reduced generally. The other part will be a fairly radical change to the wage structures for those jobs which are essential to the function of a modern society. This means that those less satisfying or more unpleasant jobs need to be rewarded more and wages that are currently paid for those jobs. I mean that the wages required to attract the people like say sewage workers, farmers, nurses, prison officers and other comparable jobs could increase to recruit and retain the required workforce. There's wages for careers like choreographers, chefs, photographers, designers could fall as more people could try to switch to those professions they seem to be more desirable. Changing the job market will continue since people have their basics like food and rent guaranteed, or prepared to take risks with their careers. This could mean that they did something that they did as a hobby or an interest, and will now try to make a career out of. Alternatively, they will retrain or educate themselves to do something that would be more rewarding, either financially, psychologically, or emotionally as a career. This is likely to leave more people setting up their own businesses, indulging in creative exports from things like writing to inventing, everything in between. The fallback of the basic income allows people to take risks they've never have previously considered. What there is unknown is the success rate of these new ventures. It's been questioned that some of the leading companies in the world were started by individuals or small groups of people taking a risk on something they were passionate about. A major factor in the successes or failures of these ventures were the quality of the ideas and also the people behind them. History, though, is also littered with people like Charles Goodyear, whose ideas and inventions have changed the world, but ended up in poverty, with others later on exploiting the work of these giants. The great unknown is what would happen to these people if their businesses and inventions have been guaranteed with a basic income. Business, though, would face an increased rate of tax in order to pay for the basic income. This could reduce the growth of existing businesses, it could, to some degree, offset the development of the new businesses. Now the impact of taxation shouldn't actually be overstated on the level of growth. Firstly, because the additional tax would only be being paid on the profits taken out of the business. Generally, surpluses invested back in growing a business wouldn't be the target of any new taxes. Secondly, because the income being paid out by the government is universal, it isn't actually as expensive as many benefits that are normally paid out by governments. It's because a universal basic income is an extremely low government administration cost compared to other benefits, such as, say, unemployment benefit. Since every adult will be in receipt of the benefit, you don't have to check on the status of the claimant. You don't have to fill in new forms and new interviews each time their status changes. Additionally, there are less fraud involved with payments since, again, it's a universal payment. The perceived downside is that since everyone is getting the payment, there may be some in greater need of assistance that may be not getting enough money, as those who don't need it may still be getting that kind of surplus. This may still require government to fund additional payments to groups like disabled to pay for needs like healthcare or transport. However, the universal payment may encourage also more people to donate some of their additional income to charities to assist those who are worse off than themselves. What is without doubt is the introduction of a universal basic income have a disruptive effect on society. There will be winners and there will be losers. Many people will find their jobs change as will the status of those jobs in society. And the wages that go alongside those jobs will also change. So any introduction needs to be carefully explained to the public beforehand and its implementation is careful planning. The question has been answered whether this planned disruption to the economy and society can be better or worse than the disruption that will occur the existing lower skilled jobs are replaced by automation or transferred to other developing countries. So how do you go about measuring the potential success or failure of implementing a universal basic income? I think this does depend upon your views of society and politics. There's some measurements that I would consider fairly important, some of which are not always considered when new policies are being introduced. There's social measures like 
the overall happiness of the population, along with the expected reduction in poverty rates and crime levels. It's also likely to be an improvement in the health of the population, both in physical health and also in their mental health. There may be significant levels to the changes to levels in employment, including worker satisfaction with their jobs, reduction in the fear of being unemployed or bankrupt. Some of the greatest unknowns of the implementation might be about inflation levels, investment in education and political engagement. But projections of traditional measures like growth and GDP will probably be the deciding factors for governance as to whether or not a universal basic income is being introduced. This interesting measure, though, will perhaps the children and the next generation. These changes will have a long-lasting impact on society, probably of the same order as votes for women and anti-discrimination legislation. So, will it happen? Myself, I think governments are able to adopt the universal basic income earlier and be more successful in the long run. However, the need for long-term planning and reduction in national debt precedes the introduction of such a system make it difficult for many governments with short-term views to consider it. So it may take a social crisis or success in other countries before a universal basic income is widely adopted.